Hello, everybody, and welcome to our fourth installment of Tuesday Talks. My name is Caroline Imperato. I'm the assistant director here at the Atwood Museum. First off, I'd like to thank you all for choosing to spend your Tuesday evening with us. It means a lot. Um, before I get to introducing our speaker for today, I have just a few housekeeping announcements to go through. Um, the first is to remind folks that we are celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. The first meeting of the Chatham Historical Society happened in 1923, and then we were officially incorporated as an organization in 1926. So we will be spending the next couple of years commemorating all these milestones. Um, the museum will be reopening to visitors starting on May 5th. And for the month of May, we will be open on Fridays and Saturdays from 10 to 4. Uh, we will be debuting, debuting our new multimedia room and education center, as well as two new exhibits this season. So please definitely make plans to stop by. We will continue our lecture series in person with a lecture by Peter Troll on May 16th. We will uh, be bringing back our concert series this summer as well. So we will be starting with our first concert on June 8th. And we also are very excited to be bringing back our Adventures in History Summer Camp this summer. And it's going to be for ages 9 to 11. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some good things planned. So for more information on any of these programs, please check out our website. We also have more information on other fun events that are going to be happening this summer. We've got a lot planned, so it's going to be great. And finally, for tonight's lecture, if you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. And um, type that in at any point. You don't have to wait to the end of the lecture. I'll be reading them out in real time. Um, and then that way we can have a bit more of an interactive sort of lecture webinar as well. So finally, for the real reason you're all here, our speaker tonight is Tyler Akabani. Tyler has established a mushroom-filled career. He provides mushrooms to Boston area gourmet restaurants. He owns his own retail shop and he spends much of his time educating the local public about the wonders of foraging via his mushroom walks. Tyler's talk will cover some of the basics of mushroom identification, as well as fun and fascinating information about our locally growing mushrooms. So please join me in welcoming Tyler Akabani. Hi, Tyler. Hi, Caroline. Thank you for the introduction. Of course. Um, all right, yeah, so I'll, I'll just hit the ground running. Uh, again, like Caroline said, if you guys have any questions as we go, feel free to just sprinkle them in there. I'm generally a very casual person, so just whenever you're, any questions you have, just throw them in there. Um, like Caroline said, I have a little shop in Somerville, so if you're ever around the Boston area, um, find us. We sell all sorts of mushrooms and other things. And um, otherwise, my other introductions for me is I've been doing this for about uh, 10 years, give or take now, um, working with restaurants uh, for the majority of it, teaching classes. And then during the pandemic, we stopped working with restaurants because restaurants closed and we started doing uh, home delivery service. And that's what led us into retail. Um, it's been really fun, and well received. Um, and then for the talk, um, my my hope is to kind of give you uh, a kind of ground knowledge or I guess familiarization with the, the world of mushrooms. I feel like uh, the typical American population doesn't really know a lot about mushrooms. My best way of exemplifying that is to ask people how many mushrooms you can name. Uh, mushrooms are a whole kingdom of life. And so if you think of how many mushrooms you can name and then compare that to a few other kingdoms like plants or animals, the number and the difference is usually huge. Like most people can't name more than 10 mushrooms. But if you were to say the same for birds or animals in general, you'd have hundreds, if not thousands, and same with plants, if you include grocery store items. Um, and so part of it is to give you a lot of stuff to familiarize with, show you a really wide selection of, of mushrooms that grow in our area here in Massachusetts, and uh, perhaps give you an interest just to go and walk around the woods and look for them and say, hey, that's cool, that's a mushroom. <laughs> Similar in a way you could look for birds. Or if um, if you're in the culinary 
persuasion than perhaps maybe not just by this talk, but you'd think about um, if you could eat a mushroom ever and a safe way to go about doing that. So uh, without further ado, I will share my screen and uh, get started. Whoops. All right. Can everybody, Caroline, can everybody see? Can you see? Yes, looks good to us. Thank you. All right. So this is really simply put mushrooms I've gotten to know in and around Massachusetts. So these are all mushrooms, mostly. There's a few outside, but uh, almost entirely in Massachusetts. And it's roughly going by the season, uh, which, which mushrooms are seasonal, just like um, if you're a bird watcher, some birds you only see certain seasons. If you're uh, if you like to eat and go to the farmer's market, some produce items will only be here during certain seasons. And so mushrooms are the same. This one is one that just grows right on my street. Um, I like this one because I feel like it's one of the earliest mushrooms I see every year. I call them mica caps. They're a teeny little mushroom that grows in the uh, little crooks of trees. You may have seen them before. And as I go through, I'm going to point out little features about mushrooms that help me cue into what they are or what their names are. Um, visually, uh, every mushroom is a little unique. And so this one, one of its unique features is that it grows in these clusters. Some mushrooms will just grow singularly. These ones are always in clusters, always right on trees. Um, and again, this is we're going through spring, roughly speaking, spring to fall time. This is a terribly out of focus picture, but uh, this is called a false morel. If um, you like to eat, these are morels. That's a morel here. One of the spring delights. This is, I don't know, I, I, perhaps people love them so much just because you have to wait all winter to eat them. But they're mushroom that only comes in the springtime. The spring is relatively selective in which mushrooms we get. But morels, one of the best mushrooms you can find and eat. Really distinctive looking. Doesn't really look like any of your typical mushrooms that you'd think of as with gills. And so while I think this is a relatively easy mushroom and a safe one, it does have a deadly look alike. <laughs> so I'll talk a lot about uh, deadly mushrooms. Um, I guess part of me thinks I shouldn't because it scares people a lot. Um, and, it's, and it is a thing uh, in America that people are really terrified of eating a mushroom and dying. But again, if you compare this to plants and animals, there's a lot of plants you can eat that can kill you that we know better. And there's a lot of animals that can kill you, but we know better than to uh, try to pet everything we see. So uh, so this is a false morel. If you look at the true morel, you can see these uh, pockets that are covering the mushroom. Um, sorry. Uh, whereas with a false morel, they're more like lobes that it looks a bit more brainy and blobby. And if you were to cut this mushroom top to bottom, inside it would be filled with a, a sort of a cottony texture as with the morels would be perfectly hollow. These mushrooms are really unique also. They're called ascomycetes. And one of the unique features of this mushrooms and a feature that I think is really important to always take note of with any mushroom you see, because it can help you identify them quickly, is the way in which spores are produced by the mushroom. Uh, mushrooms, by nature, or actually a really small portion of the organism. It is only the fruiting body. So every mushroom ever that you see in the supermarket or on the ground, that's just the fruiting body. So that's something equivalent to an apple or a fruit. It's something that is produced by the organism. So uh, it can uh, reproduce with uh, you know, like species. So a mushroom is really just there to let its spores out. And one of the unique features about ascomycetes is that they release spores via an explosive mechanism. Uh, when wind uh, blows across the morel's open pockets there, uh, the spores will fire into the air. Uh, the next little video I have here is a different type of ascomycete called a cup fungus. And it also has the same, same quality in that it fires out spores. And you can actually see it. And so in the next video, you'll hear a sound, which is me blowing into the cup of this mushroom. And then you'll see the spores fire out. Love it. Let's do one more time. Isn't that cool? <laughs> um, there's a whole bunch of ascomycetes that will do this as well. Really unique feature. Really cool. Um, a lot of mushrooms will simply drop, drop their spores out uh, and into the wind. Uh, but this one's really unique. Here's another type of cup fungus. These are all spring mushrooms. Um, isn't it lovely? Beautiful. Um, I love seeing all these different varieties of shapes. I feel like most people think of a really typical cap. 
skills, STEM, where here's something totally different. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to hop out of spring here. This is a mid, uh, late spring, early summer mushroom. Um, there aren't a lot of mushrooms that grow between. Hey, Tyler. Spring. Yeah. Someone asked if you could um, explain one more time why that, I think I'm saying this right, ask, ask the mice sure. do that sort of spraying thing. The, the question of how or why, um, I mean, it must be just an evolutionary trait that helped them survive. But in a practical sense, it helps them get their spores a further distance away. So that what triggers that is a wind or rain hitting it. And so like if it's really windy and that triggers that explosion of spores, that, that wind will carry it further off. Gotcha. Thank that you. Is. You're welcome. Um, so this is a, a reishi mushroom. Again, this is sort of in between summer and uh, summer and spring. This is a mushroom that's known for being particularly uh, medicinal. And so while well, we have mushrooms that are edible, we have mushrooms that are poisonous. There's a lot of research now in, in medicinal fungi. This one has been used traditionally in Chinese medicine for thousands of years. And I'm not terribly well versed on medicinal things, but um, my understanding is it's well thought of as, as good for the liver. And there are polysaccharides that have been found in the mushroom that are good for immune boosting properties. And so again, one of these things we sell in the stores are in the store is with these kind of adaptogen slash medicinal mushrooms. Not my expertise, really. I, I generally am interested in dinner. Um, but I do think it's neat. I've made tea out of this mushroom a bunch of times. It tastes good, a little bitter. Um, yeah. And there's a bunch of others. Chaga has become very popular. Um, we'll see some others as we go on. All right. Um, I hopped onto the phase. This whole next section is going to be of the mushrooms to, to learn right away um, so that you can dispel your worries. These are the mushrooms that are going to be the most dangerous in our area. Um, down on the cave, you guys have a lot of pine trees, and so you will see a lot of these mushrooms. These mushrooms love to grow around pine trees. And the topic of trees and mushrooms is one I'll keep coming back to. Some mushrooms only grow with trees, and uh, that's just the way it is for a lot of mushrooms. And so finding certain mushrooms, you can only find them with certain trees. And this particular group of mushrooms, although they, they like oaks and others, pine is a very common one. So this group of mushrooms is called Amanitas. And this picture here is the very beginning stage of an amanita. It's, they have what's called a universal veil. And so they literally start in this sort of egg-like shape. And as they grow, that casing, which you can see down around the bottom here, will break away as the mushroom grows up and out. And so in their youngest stage, if you were to cut them top to bottom, you can see the cap of the mushroom right here, the gills are right there, and the stalk is completely encapsulated or closed into this. So this group of mushrooms, amanitas, are some of the most dangerous, most toxic um, species uh, or genera that grow in our area. Um, and so if you learn this group and it's identifying features and you stay away from them, you're gonna be a lot safer. Uh, last year in Amherst, there was a pretty bad poisoning with this mushroom. Someone ate the most toxic one we get in our area and she had a liver transplant and she survived. Look at that, isn't that a wonderful looking mushroom? Um, that red mushroom with the white dots all over it is a type of amanita, those white dots are uh, that universal egg or that film that covers the mushroom when they're very young. As you can see this outer layer, as it breaks away, it sticks. And each species of Amanita, that covering sticks in a different way. And so by noting the visual context of how that sticks, uh, you'll, you can help identify your mushroom. All right, so this is the worst one we get in our area. This is called the angel of death mushroom, Amanita phalloides or phalloides. Um, just look at it, take all its visual features in. Um, when you're looking at mushrooms, visual features are can be very important. So they're growing in a little group, they're growing right on the ground. It's hard to tell, but down here at the base of the mushroom, you can see it is a little bulbous. If you look behind that one, you can see it. Amanitas very, very often have a bulbous base that's underneath the ground, slender stem. There's a little bit of skirt you can see in this background that would be covering the gills when it's young. And when they're very young, all amanitas have white gills and they continue to stay white. Um, again, colors of gills and caps are different for every mushroom, but all amanitas have white gills. Another feature to make note of. Um, hey, Tyler. Is, yeah, yeah. We have another question. Please. This is, this is great. All right. So Ted asks, um, 
mentions, I have read that in France, one could go into a pharmacy and the pharmacist could help identify any mushrooms, including anything that might be poisonous. Is yeah. there any service like that in the U.S.? Um, I have heard that in France. I heard that it's less common nowadays, but that it was a part of um, the pharmacy training. I love that. I wish there was. I want to say... <laughs> Is, I, is, does anyone work for an insurance company that would insure me to do such a thing? I'd be happy to do it. Um, no, I don't think so. There's there's no service I know of, but there are a lot of clubs regionally. Um, and so there's a Boston Mycological Club. They're a really great resource. Uh, there are online and Facebook groups where people do things like this. Some mushrooms I think are relatively easy to identify via photograph like this one. Um, and so I'd say groups like that. There, there used to be a Cape Cod club. I'm not so certain there is any more. Um, a guy named Wes um, was running it, but um, not there's not no pharmacy. But mm -hmm. um, certainly, if if you could find a club or an online source, um, that would be good. I would love that. though. wouldn't that be cool? Um, <laughs> be like that. What's the uh, the poison control number? It's a mushroom control number. Oh yeah. And there's people, I mean, I don't know who does it for Massachusetts, but I, I met a guy who did it for Pennsylvania. And there's like usually a regional expert who like, if someone eats a mushroom, they mm -hmm. hopefully have a picture of the mushroom they ate beforehand. And they can yeah. say like, yeah, they'll be fine. Or like, you better get to the hospital right away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So this is the next in line. This is equally terrible to eat. Uh, but however, this is an import mushroom slash um a mushroom that is not native to our area. And so this one comes with a story, which was this, I took this picture last fall and it was after I went to buy, uh, I work with a guy who sells tofu um, really close to where I live. And I went there and he had this mushroom in his office. <laughs> he didn't even say anything. I was walking out with my tofu and he goes, oh, Tyler, I picked this mushroom. I think it's an agaricus, right? It looks pretty good. Um, and agaricus is a name, is a, uh, the genus name for what we think of as button mushrooms or portobellos. They're agaricus bisporus. And this is a death cap mushroom. And he didn't say he was going to eat it. He said he was checking with me first, but he had a bunch of them. <laughs> so I'm glad he didn't eat them. And this is a deadly, deadly mushroom that came from Europe. And so, um, I'm not sure exactly which tree, but this was in a park in Jamaica Plain, um, children's park. Uh, just growing there um, underneath a tree that was imported. So a bunch of these are now growing uh, in and around the United States, kind of the same way we have um, invasive species of plants and birds and all sorts of other things. There's invasive species. I don't know invasive is the right word, but um, there are non-native species of mushrooms that come. And probably the Arnold Arboretum would be a great place to look for things like that because trees from there uh, historically were picked up in Italy or China or wherever, and they pick them up with all the dirt and they plant them here. And when you do that, you're bringing the uh, fungal partners along with the trees. And I've been brushing over this fungal partner and tree mushroom relationship. So at some point I'll, I'll jump into that. Uh, we'll keep going over a few more Amanitas. Um, this one's not an Amanita, but I threw it in here because it has some similarities. Look, it has like little thingies on the cap. It has a, a skirt there. It's something about this growing pattern. It's, it's in a big wood chip mulch. These are not actually warts in the same way. Uh, and Amanita has the warts on top that are kind of, you can slip them off. This is more of a, uh, a part of the cap. Uh, if I'm, I'm not gonna guess, if I'm not, I will guess. I think it's a leucocoprimus or some sort of mushroom in that world, but not an Amanita. Here's another, another question for you, Tyler, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so we no. have, are mushrooms that are poisonous to humans also poisonous to animals? Um. Some mushrooms that are poisonous to us are poisonous to, uh, well, hold on. Some animals can eat mushrooms we can't, not all animals. Uh, so I want to reckon if a mammal ate some of these deadly mushrooms, they would die. But a slug, maybe not, because I've seen slugs eating them. That being said, I never followed the slug home to see what happened later that night. <laughs> but, um, but I know that there are animals like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like monarch butterflies, the caterpillar of that can, can eat some stuff that's toxic if I'm not mistaken. Someone, someone out there might know better than I am. I do, but um, I think so. And I know that there definitely are animals that love to eat the same mushrooms we love to eat. So like porcini, lactarius. Um, I, I have a mushroom that you'll see later that I'll bring mushrooms home to give to my squirrels, not pet squirrels, just squirrels in my backyard. <laughs> but there are, they definitely have 
love to eat them. And sometimes that can actually help me find mushrooms too. Um, you'll see you follow deer tracks and the deer will eat certain mushrooms. Then you'll say, oh, this may be a good area for this mushroom. Okay. So a handful of different amanitas just to show you the diversity. Here's a yellow capped one with the white dots. And again, all these little things can wipe right off. And so visually like this cap could look nice and smooth sometimes, but other times be nice and, and warty. Also, these are not, not all amanitas are deadly, but the group is better to avoid. This is a beautiful mushroom. I was very happy to find a couple of years ago uh, called uh, Amanita jacksonii. And if anyone out there is really getting into mushrooms, um, they've taken this out of the gen genus Amanita, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and this has been happening a lot in the mushroom research in the past five to 10 years is that um, thanks to genetic research, the, the whole kingdom is getting mixed up of uh, where things were once placed in certain genera's are getting moved to other ones. If anyone really wants me to tr pretend like I know a lot about it, I'll try. But I'm, anyways, it's not Amanita anymore, but it looks just like an Amanita. It's an edible mushroom, but it has orange gills and it's just a wonderful, beautiful mushroom. Very popular in Italian cuisine. Um, over there, it's called the Caesar's mushroom. They pick them when they're big eggs like that. And supposedly it has the name because once upon a time, it was favored by the Caesar and anyone who found them had to bring them to the Caesar. Um, you can see that cup on the bottom there that uh, once encapsulated the whole mushroom. A few more Amanitas. This is our local version of the red and white spotted fairy tale mushroom. Ours is called Amanita muscaria variation gasoei. Uh, it's the same, but it's not red. It's more yellow orange. You guys get a lot of those on the Cape. Uh, so fall time, if you're driving up and down Route 6, um, there's, there's huge ones sometimes. They're glorious. Don't eat them. <laughs> Just another lovely, amanitas are beautiful. I think they're a lovely mushroom. Uh, there's other visual features. So when you really look into mushrooms, you want to take in all of it. And so this little thing down here by the foot, you can see those little crinkles along the leg of the mushroom. Uh, those are an identifying visual feature. Not an amanita, but really similar. This is an edible mushroom called a parasol mushroom. This stem is really fibrous. Amanitas are really delicate. And this one I threw in here, it's called LBMs. So as we talk about mushrooms, if you're really interested in edible stuff, LBM stands for a little brown mushroom. And you can typically just kind of avoid them. There are a few that are edible, but there's a whole bunch that look relatively similar and or take a lot of time to identify and probably would not make a very big meal. So um, mushroom hunting for me is a relatively practical matter. And I, I would say all of the really good, yummy, edible mushrooms are well-known. Um, all the good ones that are kind of easy to identify are well-known uh, for a good reason in that if you're passing down information to people, the stuff that's easier to remember remember gets passed down. And so stick to the, the tried and true mushrooms. So this is a kind of a, a more unusual black trumpet mushroom. We're hopping out of Amanita and we're jumping over to kind of vase-shaped mushrooms. So mushrooms that have a more vase-like shape. If anyone remembers, uh, 20, summer of 2021 uh, and fall of 2021, we had a really spectacular mushroom year. And so when it's, when it's um, terrible uh, beach weather, get out there and look for mushrooms because it's been raining a lot. You'll be more likely to find mushrooms and it can be a really great showing to see really cool stuff. So this is a black trumpet mushroom, a uh, little bit different variety. You can see the underside here as something that I would call false gills. So there's true gills, which are like paper standing up on its end, you know, paper, paper. And then there's false gills, which are more like wrinkled skin. This is almost like you took the flesh of the mushroom and scrunched it up. And you can see if you look very closely in there, little veins that are going between, um, between the gills or false gills. Um, that's just another visual feature. And this is where the spores are produced. And so again, always looking to see how the mushroom is producing spores. Another um, mushroom uh, that's related to black trumpets in the crateralis family. They call them crateralis because they have a, um, a hole that runs down the center. Oh, I skipped over a few pictures here. Sorry. Here's another black trumpet crater. They have this hole, again, hole that runs down the center. Same with this one. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, another one. So these yellow foots. They have a hole that runs down the center and you can see a little sort of belly button feature there. And then some of the favorites around the world, we have chanterelles. 
these are not craterellus, they're called cantharellus. They're chunky mushrooms. Uh, this is a, a kind of pink colored one we get in our area, which is really pretty. They never get very large. And this is a more typical golden chanterelle, wonderful mushroom for eating uh, summer through fall time. They can grow pine trees. I'm sure there must be on the Cape. Um, also oak trees and beech trees. This is a West Coast chanterelle, um, but you can see again, that really typical nature of the fall skills. They don't always show this, obviously, but you can really see between the, the veins there. And this is one of your lookalikes. So uh, along with visual features, uh, another aspect to be aware of with mushrooms is uh, kind of the mushrooms preference or the mushrooms um, growing habits. Um, growing habits for me would mean on the ground or in a field or on a tree or around a tree. These are all different ways that a mushroom might grow, singularly scattered or clusters. This would be a cluster here. And so this is a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Uh, this is listed as a look-alike to the chanterelle and a look-alike to honey mushrooms, which we'll see later. For me, they do not look like it or chicken of the woods, which is really doesn't look like chicken of the woods if you look past the orange color. Um, this is a gilled mushroom. And uh, another neat feature is it glows in the dark. You could bring it home if it's nice and fresh and get in a really dark space and it will glow a faint green color. It's really cool. I've done it. And so this mushroom grows in clusters and on trees. It will make you very sick. It won't kill you. Another question. Yeah. Um, Laura wants to know, is the black trumpet edible? Yes, sorry. And I have one on my shirt here. Black trumpet is yeah. an edible mushroom. Yeah. It's a really good one. I want to say it's a lot of people's favorite mushroom. It's really floral, has a lot of wonderful, uh, nice aroma to it. You have to pick a lot of them to get like a, a pound or whatever, but um, a little bit goes a long way also. They have a really wonderful flavor. Their only downside is they can be dirty uh, because they're hollow dirt can land in the center mm -hmm. of the mushroom. And that's one of the mushrooms that has my kind of like big fish story. I won't tell the whole thing, but Sometimes when you find a lot, you find a lot. So I want to say, um, I'm trying to think, not a football field, but maybe a quarter of a football field. Once I, I found an area that was just completely covered in black trumpets in a huge way. Not a, I took off my shirt and I filled my shirt with mushrooms. And I filled my basket and awesome. I couldn't pick enough. Um, that's great. They dry nicely also. So you can dry a lot of mushrooms and that, that one's particularly good for drying and saving through the winter and making our risottos with. Um, all right, this is another vase mushroom. This one, there's some mushrooms some people can eat and some people can't. Uh, I know some people say they can eat this mushroom. I haven't, but this is a scaly vase chanterelle. Um, it is not a chanterelle, it's a gomphus. And if you, if I could turn it over for you, which I can't, you see it's really solid and has these little uh, scales on the top. So just something to be aware of. It's kind of sour flavor wise. This was my squirrel eaten mushroom that I mentioned. So we're going on to a group of mushrooms called Lactarius. And this is one of the mushrooms I'll bring home for my squirrels. You can see all the chew marks here. Uh, so squirrels love this mushroom. They I will find it a lot like this. Um, and sometimes you'll even see them up in trees. So squirrels will take them up into the trees and eat them and save them for later. Um, you could also put this in, in a, I'm using a really uh, blanket term for a big group of mushrooms. You could call them brittle gills. Uh, it's because they are very brittle, and so they crumble if you were to apply some pressure. Uh, so here's a video. They're called lactarius for a reason. So when you cut them or break them, they have the exude a milk in a similar way to uh, perhaps the way a dandelion would exude a milk. So all that is just from two slices I made, and you can see all that milk coming in. A lactarius group is not a terribly dangerous group. There are several good edible ones. There's a few that you don't want to eat also. Um, typically I avoid anything with a color, a colorful uh, milk to it. So I wouldn't eat this one. And as you can see, there is a slug there. Um, I hear my wife and child walk on the stairs. So I'm, you might see a little kid run up to my screen, just a warning. Uh, here's a big table full of lactarius from a, a few summers ago. You wanna come say hi? All right, really quick. Okay, you don't want to say hi. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is a big lactarius there over here. These are peppery lactarius, those white ones there. Um, these ones I would typically avoid, but again, some people say they could eat them. And then 
Let's see. All right, we're moving on to, this is a really wonderful looking mushroom. These are called indigo lactarius mushrooms. You can see this blue coloring in the gills. And we got a whole little photo shoot here of this indigo lactarius, also edible. So I found these, these are upstate New York. These are not ones that I, I do not find these normally around here. And you can see by the habitat here, that all these pine needles it's growing right around pine trees. And then we brought them home. There's that milk and we cooked them. And so you can see how blue they are. I feel like I once upon a time heard someone say there's no natural blue foods in the world. I'd say that's pretty blue if you ask me. <laughs> and they're good, it is really good. It looks strange, doesn't it? Um, but wonderful, yummy mushroom, really nutty, really good mushroom. All right, and so one last one, this is uh, sort of a lactarius. This is called a lobster, lobster mushroom. Lobster mushroom is uh, a lactarius mushroom that gets a secondary fungus that grows over it. And so you can see this here, once upon a time was the gills, and now it's covered with this film, which is the secondary fungus, um, it's edible and pretty unusual, pretty cool. Not something I found in Massachusetts, I think the Vermont. All right, I saw a question pop up. Um, or, okay, never mind. All right, so we're hopping over to uh, the, the bolete section here. Um, this is probably one of my favorite groups to pick mushrooms from. This group of mushrooms is, um, Visually, the things that are distinct about them is that they are porous on the underside. So where you would think of your grocery store mushroom as having gills, these instead have little holes, just like a sponge. Then they're cap and stemmed mushrooms. So they have a long stem cap and they always are gonna be growing alongside trees. Um, so this is probably one of the best edible mushrooms, I would say. This is a type of porcini mushroom. And I'm gonna use that word relatively as a blanket phrase for, uh, for, I'm gonna say white reticulate stock uh, bolides, and I can explain what that means, but uh, porcini is pretty famous Italian mushroom, really yummy. Uh, we probably have what I'm gonna call porcini, about five or six in our area. Um, and they all will have, if you look just underneath the cap where the stem is, this white veininess, almost like a spider web, laid a, a spider laid a web all along this, it's all white. Um, and as it gets older, this white porous material will turn a kind of yellow color. Let me flip up and hold on. I'm gonna close the door just to get my sound. Okay. Oops. It's not going to the next slide. Having a little technical difficulty. Are you able to use your keyboard? Yeah, the keyboard isn't um, isn't moving. Hmm. Any suggestions, Christina? Do I try just pressing escape? Okay. And then go back to the slideshow button. Okay, there we go. All right, here's another, we're back to porcini. We're just gonna go through a few different varieties. This is a different uh, species that grows in New Hampshire. And so porcini can be anywhere from tan to yellow to red on top. And so this is our lookalike to the porcini. And I'll, I'll jump back and forth to show you. So this is what's called a bitter bolete. It's not poisonous, it just doesn't taste very good. And it has this dark reticulation on the underside here. If you jump back to the white reticulate stock, you see this is a white veininess here, or this is a dark veininess. If you were to eat this, it would just taste very bad. Um, wouldn't kill you. A few other porcini. And so this is where we get into why I love bolides. You just get these really dynamic mushrooms. So this is called Old Man of the Woods. It is... Um, so this is a fresh mushroom. Um, and I think just this name is another reason why I think mushroom hunting is really fun. There's just a lot of quirkiness involved in the world of mushroom hunting. Uh, really funky, unique mushroom. Let's see the underside here. Really 
uh, pronounced pores on the underside. This kind of cool starry breakaway of the, the top of the mushroom. Another really dynamic mushroom. This is called uh, Frost's bolete or Boletus frostii. Again, this is a mushroom which has had its genus name changed. It used to be Boletus frostii. Now it's Exudoporus frostii. Regardless, it's a wonderful looking mushroom. It's red on top, red on the bottom. Gives you all the signs of a thing you probably think you should not eat. It does uh, happen to be edible though. So this is a mushroom you can eat. It has a kind of tart yellow flavor. Okay, wait, I'm gonna pause. And so again, with that kind of dynamic nature of boletes and why I think they're so fun, a lot of mushrooms will give you a staining reaction, similar to the way if you were to cut a potato or an apple and you wait a little while, the apple would turn uh, brown over time. Uh, there's gotta be some other fruits that I could think of, but there's some mushrooms that do a very, very quick staining reaction. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean the mushroom is good or bad to eat, but it is a feature uh, that can help you identify a mushroom. Oh. You can see a couple seconds go by and then that blue color will come up really quickly. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this mushroom is called uh, Boletus sensibilis, sensibilis, which in short means sensitive, which you can tell it's having, a, it's, its pores are very sensitive to the touch. And so they stain colors very quickly. It's a mushroom you probably should avoid eating. This is another one you can see staining reaction just from a little light touch. A few more funky looking boletes. Technically, this is a Swillis, always around pine. I'm sure you guys see this a lot on the Cape um, in piney areas, especially around swamps. A few more cool looking boletes. This one has a really uh, intense reticulation. So that's really distinctive. This is Russell's bolete. And so part of, for me, even if I'm not eating a mushroom, finding really cool mushrooms, I think is wonderful. This one has this nice spotted pattern on the cap, which is again, part of its identifying features. Um, okay, so before we hop to the next one, um, I guess this next one, the overlay here is a lot of the mushrooms you just saw are summer mushrooms. Next, we're gonna go into tree mushrooms uh, in or polypores, which just like boletes will mean they have a lot of holes, but they're not stereotypical cap and stem mushrooms. So they're mushrooms that have pores, but not in your typical mushroom shape. This is a wonderful edible mushroom and one I would highly recommend is a starting and or beginner's edible mushroom. Uh, this is called chicken of the woods or chicken mushroom. There's another mushroom called hen of the woods, which is another really great mushroom to start with, but uh, that one will come later. This is more in the summertime to start and we'll see it through fall time. They love to grow on or around oak trees. I found this mushroom uh, the day my wife's uh, water broke, <laughs> just moments before. Um, and so this one was in July. A uh, really great edible mushroom. If I have one tip for this one is to make sure it's tender when you pick it, because they can get, uh, as they age, they get very woody. So we got a few more of this. Beautiful mushroom. Underside is pores. Again, differentiating it from the, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom I mentioned earlier. And again, if you're ever interested in eating a mushroom, it's, you always want to cross-reference as many ways as you can. Check several books, check online. Mushroomexpert.com is a really great resource. They don't tell you if it's edible or not, but it will help you know if the mushroom you found is what you think it is. This is a, a group of people who are very happy to find this mushroom. Um, believe it or not, this looks way smaller than it did in person. These were each... Each one of those was like a full steak. So um, good edible mushroom. Sometimes you find just one on a tree. It's enough to, to make many, many meals with. On ethical foraging and harvesting, even if you pick all of this mushroom, it doesn't harm the uh, organism. If you were to pick all of this, hopefully the next year would be nice and rainy and this mushroom would continue to come back. On the other hand though, this could be food for another animal in the area. Uh, bugs might be living in them. So you are always disturbing the habitat, but um, the less so, the better. Take what you need, don't take too much more. More polypores, non-edible one here. This one, uh, for those of you who knit out there, this one is called the um, 
what is it called? Dyer's polypore, D-Y-E-R-S, Dyer's polypore. And it's because this mushroom can be used to make a dye with that will color wool. And you can get a bunch of different colors out of this, depending on which um, mordants you use. So I believe you can get yellows and greens. Uh, it's a really cool mushroom, non-edible. Another mushroom I threw in here for the dyeing purposes. Um, I can't remember the name of this one off the top of my head, but another one you can get dyes from. And this one's technically not a polypore, but it's close enough. Uh, it's called a beef steak polypore. Again, technically not a polypore because of the way the pores are, um, but uh, edible mushroom, really funky, tart flavor. It's a mushroom that grows on chestnut trees. And so chestnut is a tree we don't really have growing in our area as commonly as we once did. Similar chestnut, hemlock, ash, there's probably another one in there, but are there trees that are sort of disappearing from our area uh, because of bacteria or bugs? So chestnut's one of them, and this now grows more on oak trees. All right, so we hopped into fall with this mushroom. This is called a hen of the woods. So very similar name, but very different look. Uh, this is a really great beginner's mushroom. This is a mushroom. I never noticed that. Another little mushroom on the other side there. Um, really great mushroom. It can get huge. There are reports of 100 pound head of the woods out there in the world. Um, it's a fantastic mushroom. This is the third mushroom I picked as a novice forager. Uh, first was morels, black trumpets, and then hen of the woods. Porous, again, porous mushroom, always on trees, oak trees. A few more funky mushrooms. If I'm not mistaken, we're gonna be going into the uh, weird and wild mushrooms out there. So we're looking at some really interesting pores. So these are look somewhere between gills and pores. And so these are technically pores that behave a bit more like gills. Um, I believe this is called a, a maize gilled polypore, but it doesn't look like a little maize. All right, again, we're into fall season here. Um, that's another polypore there, but this is perhaps a little bit more of an important one. This is a gilled mushroom. Uh, this is called a honey mushroom. For me, this is a relatively easy mushroom to identify, but still I would go with a little more caution with this one. Edible, really popular amongst, um, I think a lot of people actually, but I, I thought of it as a relatively popular in Eastern European cuisine, but I recently talked to someone from a Northern part of China and she said they ate it there when she was a kid, but she had a very different name for it. Uh, it took me a while to figure it out, but I'm pretty sure this is what they're eating. Um, they always are in clusters. They're a parasitic mushroom. So it's a mushroom that kills trees. And so when you find this mushroom, often the tree will be dead or dying. Uh, again, it's gilled. It has a white spore print. We haven't talked about spores really much so far, but uh, a fun experiment to do is to take a mushroom, cut the cap off, put it on a piece of paper, cover it with a bowl. If you wait a day-ish, um, you should have enough time to, for the spores to fall out of the mushroom and congregate on the paper and give you a color. So you can wipe it and look at it on your finger. And if you look down here on the cap of some of these mushrooms, the caps have collected spores. And so there's a kind of white powdery color. The color of this mushroom's spores help you identify it and differentiate it from what's called a lookalike. I think they look very different, but again, a lookalike uh, called the deadly gallerina. Uh, which has a rusty red brown to dark dark brown spore print. The deadly gallerina is very small, also, but they are both fall mushrooms. They're both mushrooms that grow on trees. They can cluster. This is a much more robust mushroom, though. Um, a few questions that no one asked, but I'm going to answer. Um, you can touch any mushroom, even the deadly deadly ones. You just don't want to ingest them. So basically any mushroom you see, if you want to investigate and look, you can pick it up, you can hold it, you can smell it. You just don't want to uh, eat it. Uh, some mushrooms, uh, like a bolete, for example, there are really no uh, boletes in our area that will kill you. Um, I say that with some little hesitation, like you could get really, really sick eating some boletes. But, um, but if I found a bolete and I thought it looked pretty good, I would take a nibble and see if it gave me a bitter sensation or if it tasted really good. Um, but I would only do that with a mushroom in a group that is relatively safe. I wouldn't do it with anything that looked like an Amanita. A young honey mushroom here. 
So we're into fall now. Um, these can occur in the, the summertime also, but this is a, another really unique mushroom. And what's unique about it is the way that it produces spores. So these spores are produced on hairs. And you can see it in the corner here and up there. Um, rather than gills or pores, they are little spines. This is called a hedgehog mushroom, edible mushroom. Not really a lot of other mushrooms with, um, with little projections like this in our area. Um, there's one called a sarcodon that wouldn't taste very good. Nothing that I can think of that would kill you or make you super sick. Again, hedgehog. We're getting into other funky fall mushrooms. This is called a shaggy mane, and this is an older stage. You can see this black coloring on the bottom here. This mushroom's magic power is that it turns to goo, and then the spores get washed away um, by the rain. But when it's very young, it's a good edible, but you have to eat it within 24 hours, otherwise it turns into black goo. More funky fall mushrooms. So blue it, another edible mushroom. Look at that beautiful color, lilac color. This is another mushroom that you'd have to do a spore print with if you wanted to identify it and differentiate it from a lookalike, which this is the lookalike. It's, this is a type of Quartinarius. And so if you were to do a spore print between a blue it, it'd be a lilac spore print. And if you were to do a uh, Quartinarius, it'd have a rusty spore print. Wouldn't kill you, but still don't want to eat it. All right, we're really getting into the funky uh, mushrooms here. This is a cauliflower mushroom. Super unique. This is the only mushroom that looks like this, uh, aside from another cauliflower mushroom that has a more uh, flat lobiness to it. Edible mushroom also. Pine trees, it's borderline parasitic. Um, so if you find this around a tree, probably your tree is going to have to get cut down at some point. Oyster mushrooms. Same thing you would find in the supermarket, this wild one, much more robust. I think I found this in wintertime, actually. This is one of the few ones I'll still find in the winter. Anoki mushroom. Uh, this one I threw on here just because it looks so different from the store-bought mushroom. If you have ever had those really long skinny mushrooms that look almost like noodles, uh, probably from an Asian supermarket, those are anoki. And this is what anoki looks like in the wild in our area. Totally different. Has a fuzzy brown stem and its species name, uh, Volutopes, references that. Velvety foot, Volutopes foot. So it has a velvety foot and a sticky brown orange cap. Looks nothing like the cultivated version. Uh, the cultivated version, they grow in the bottom of a long jar and the mushrooms grow out to get to the oxygen source. And that's what makes them spindly and long. Another super unique local mushroom, lion's mane, edible always growing on trees. And look at those spiky projections, really unique. Um, and then I threw some other oddballs in here. Uh, these are called, and these are technically not mushrooms. They once were thought to be, but this is a slime mold. Um, slime molds are just neat. They, um, actually this is not a slime mold, but this is a slime mold, raspberry slime mold. Uh, they used to be thought of as fungi and or mushrooms, but about, I don't know, 10 years ago-ish, they are reclassified into their own family. And um, I think largely because they move, these um, have people have taken them and put them inside mouse trap, mouse mazes or whatever. And they put food sources in one end and they put the slime mold in the other and they are able to find a path of shortest distance to the food, which then makes you think, how much, is this smarter than a mouse? And then they've other done other ones where they put uh, top, they've taken topographical topographical maps of the United States and Japan and a few other countries, and they put slime mold uh, sorry food sources in all the major metropolitan areas, and then they put a slime mold in there also, and the slime mold was able to make um, pathways that were very very similar to the highways that we've created as humans, except the slime molds paths were more efficient than ours, so makes you think. Other cool funky mushrooms. This one is another glow in the dark fungus called uh, Pinellus stipticus. It can also be used as a styptic. I've never tried that, but I have seen it glow and glows. It's pretty cool. Teeny little mushrooms growing on pine cones. These are just, I'm just cycling through fun mushrooms. Look at the leaves here. There's something about how tiny and fine those little fibers are. Turkey tail mushroom. This is a mushroom that's been purported to have really great uh, benefits for people going through chemotherapy. It's supposed to be very helpful. 
and other oddballs. This is a mushroom someone found in Maine and sent to me called Polyzealous Multiplex. I think that's supposed to suggest there's a bunch of ones that look like this. Uh, it came off of a five pound mushroom, all black, solid, edible, tasted like Sharpies. I'd eat it again, but just, just because it's such a rare mushroom, I'd never seen it before. And these are black trumpets that are not black, just to show you some diversity. Stinky mushrooms. These are called stinkhorn mushrooms in America. They are an edible mushroom. In China, they're called bamboo fungus. Um, and these ones have a very strong aroma that attracts uh, flies to land on them. And then on the top here uh, is where there's a spore mass. And so the flies land there, they fly away with the spores and they grow elsewhere. Uh, gardeners hate these mushrooms because they grow in your garden and they're very hard to get rid of. This is a squid stinkhorn. Um, again, very stinky. Where are we going to go? A bully growing through someone's sprinkler system. <laughs> That's a Cheeto in my hand. And these are uh, witch's butter. So this is a mushroom you'll see a lot probably on the Cape. They like pine trees. Edible. I've never eaten it. Fantastic. Blue mushrooms. If you ever go for a walk in the woods and you see sticks that are colored blue, it's because of this fungus and the mycelium that they have that grows through there that stains the wood. And this is a truck, uh, a wheelbarrow full of mushrooms. Some years there are wonderfully huge amounts of mushrooms out there, uh, like 2021. Other years there's nothing, like 2022. And so you have a big variety from year to year. And one of the things that's fascinating to me about mushrooms is uh, the relationships they'll have with trees. Um, it's called a mycorrhizal relationship. And so what's cool about that for me is that that relationship is there all year round, even when there's a terrible drought, uh, that life is there supporting the tree and vice versa. The tree is supporting the mushroom. Um, they share nutrients, the fungal network, which is a sort of white fiber in the earth, uh, eats minerals and digests them and gives them to the tree and gives the tree water. And the tree in turn gives the fungal partner sugars. And so year after year, if you don't see a mushroom, it's kind of, kind of really cool because this tree, if the tree back there is 50 years old, that fungal relationship is then there almost the whole time. And there are years we'll see nothing. Um, and there's mushrooms you only see like once every five years, but that goes to show that that relationship is there the whole time and just unbeknownst to us. So there's a lot of stuff going on uh, that we don't really get to see. We're getting to the end here. Other funky shapes, these are called coral mushrooms. They got a lot of different colors. I think this is my last one. Um, just a really pretty funky coral mushroom to show off a little bit of the diversity of the mushroom world and all the shapes that we have out there. Not at all. Okay. Um, questions or anybody? Um, can... Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Um, yeah. So does anyone, we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone wants to jump in, I have one question from someone right here that says, what made you get into mushrooms? Um, before I do this, how do I stop sharing my screen? <laughs> if you go to the bottom where it says like Q&A, chat, share screen, mm -hmm. click on share screen. And okay. Let you stop. All right, there you go. Someone else did it for me, thank you. Um, okay, so how did I get into mushrooms? Um, I think it was a, it was a convergent of a lot of things. I like being outdoors. I like woodsy areas. Um, and at that time in my life, I also was starting to become interested in cuisine and food. And so I was cooking a lot and getting cookbooks, kind of like fine dining cookbooks. The probably one of the big ones was the French laundry cookbook. And you'd see recipes in there like use a pound of morels or a pound of chanterelles along with this or that. And I'd say, where can I get a pound of morels or a pound of chanterelles? And so the only way I knew how to get them was to find them. Um, and so while I was working as a teacher, the campus of where I worked had morels that grew there naturally. And so one day I just saw them and was like, oh, I know what that is because I'd had the Audubon, had the Audubon salamander book and the mushroom book. And so when I saw the morel, I think I knew like, oh, that's a weird morel I saw. And so from there, I asked the local club, the Boston Mycological Club, someone confirmed it. And then I ate it 
And it was very, it was like a really, um, there's something very satisfying about finding something in the wild and eating it. It's, um, it's cool. And so I think that was like enough of a little spark for me to continue doing it. And so then every day on my way to school, I would stop in the woods and look for mushrooms and on the way home and it snowballed into a hobby, into a profession. And here I am still doing it. Here you are giving lectures about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I have someone else ask what your favorite mushroom is. It took me a long time to say it, but I think it's porcini. Porcini, it's just really yummy and really diverse and you can do a lot with it. Uh, but then if you open it up past there, there's the, my second favorite mushroom is 10, 10 different mushrooms. So I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Um, another question. Um, all, okay, read this right. Um, so you're talking about mushrooms all around Massachusetts. Which area do you think offers the most or best, you know, for foraging mushrooms within uh, Massachusetts? It probably depends more on the rain than anywhere else. All of Massachusetts, not all, but I mean, the cave has a really unique habitat, but the rest of the inland of Massachusetts has a pretty similar woodland. And so for me, it's often tree-based. And so I touched on this idea that certain mushrooms only grow with certain trees. And so um, oak is a mushroom, a tree I love to hunt around. And almost all the forests in Massachusetts have oak. Um, and so for that to be said, most of the forest in Massachusetts is new growth. Um, I don't know how many years, hundreds of years ago, but hundreds some odd years ago, people chopped down all the woods here and had sheep and farming and yada, yada. And then when the mid, my understanding is when the Midwest proved itself to be a really great place to grow uh, and farm, people left and then trees just started growing again. So everything is sort of in a similar state of hemlock, maple, oak. Um, so yeah, basically wherever has the most rain. Okay. That's my, my go-to. Very nice. And I think that was our last question. Unless anyone else has any, I think that's it. So I'd like to say thank you, Tyler. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to speak to us all. And I think uh, from some of the comments I've got already, people are really have enjoyed this. And I think you've ignited some uh, folks to go start foraging. Be careful. Go out, take your time. Yes. Yeah, uh, go slow, everyone. <laughs> I think there's there's one year mushrooms and there's five year mushrooms. So if you really are starting, start with the, the ones that don't have any deadly lookalikes. Search online. If you find something you think you can eat, search that mushroom and deadly lookalikes, um, chicken, hens. Um, Go slow, don't go too fast, but yeah. Cool. It's great. In general, um, uh, just uh, familiarization, say that a million times, just go out and look, just keep looking at them and eventually you'll start to feel more confident with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, you heard that folks, you heard it here. All right. All right, well, thank you so much, Tyler. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. And um, Check our website. We've got uh, lots more wonderful speakers coming your way for 2023. So we'll see you all later. Thanks again, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Bye.